Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913. The interview series Reflections in Time was begun by the late Professor Paul Borgi more than 15 years ago. This new series continues Paul's work and is dedicated to his memory. This is how Paul began many of the 73 interviews that he recorded. It's often exciting to look at the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop. Stop and take a look at the past of the university the people and the happenings that helped make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join me for Reflections in Time. My name is Jack Newton. I'm retired now, but I'm still active as a professor emeritus. I've been on the faculty of UN Omaha since 1960 and served for 20 years as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I worked closely with Paul Borgi in the development of his original interview series and can think of no more fitting tribute to him than to continue this work. This afternoon, which is a uh, beautiful afternoon in the late, uh, well, I guess the last Friday in April, ninth, the year 2000, we're here in the studios uh, at, on the UN Omaha campus of KYNE. And I have as my guest uh, Dr. Warren Frankie, uh, professor of journalism in the communication department, a uh, person I've known for a long time. Welcome, Warren. We're glad, glad to hear you here with us. I'm glad to be here. I've been a fan of this series, and I'm glad to take part in it. Well, you've uh, you've been here at uh, on, at UN Omaha almost as long as I have. So uh, you've seen a lot of things go on. A lot, a lot yeah, of 35 years. I, I, I probably first set foot on campus as a high school student coming out here for some kind of an event, like mm -hmm. in a basketball game. But um, I first took a class in 1954 at night while wow. I was working for old time days. At well, the that Omaha means World you've been Health. here longer than I have yeah. then in terms of having yeah. seen the university long before I ever saw it. Um, you, you know, we've known each other for a long time, but I don't think I've ever... Uh, really asked you about uh, where you came from and what your roots are. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Came all the way from Council Bluffs. That far? That far. <laughs> um, what's, I've always said that if you were from Council Bluffs, you didn't have to go to New York City or the West Coast to make it big. You just had to come to Omaha. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, I came from a family on my father's side of Lutheran ministers stretching back from my grandfather to the, sixth, the 17th century when August Hermann Franke, or Franca as they would call him, was the leader of the Pietist movement and was the man who recruited the first Protestant missionaries. I remember once um, upon a time I found something in a, about uh, the Frankies in Germany. After the Cold War ended and uh, Germany reunited, they began to revive the Franke or Franca Institute mm -hmm. in uh, Halle, Germany. It's a building about the size of the Louvre mm -hmm. and it was part of his effort as a leader of that movement, he was, a, I guess, a tremendous fundraiser who um, gathered money for orphanages, for homes for widows of ministers, for libraries, and so on, and I still don't know the full story of that, but I have read his biography. Well, oh, and uh, on my mother's side, I started to say on my, yeah. on my mother's side, Iowa farmers, uh, okay. generally. So you grew up in Council Bluffs? Yeah. Went, went to high school there? Went to Abraham Lincoln High School, and um, uh, worked on the student newspaper, was the sports editor of the, of the Echo, the student paper, and um, I lived backyards. My backyard touched the backyard of the editorial page editor of the World Herald, Reed Zimmerman. Ah. And his sons all became newspaper journalists. One of them was my age, Ken Zimmerman, who became a, a successful newspaper journalist and later public relations practitioner. So I grew up next to newspaper people, and on Sundays when his father would go in to read proofs for the Monday editorial page, I'd go over there to the World Herald and.
um, slide down the brass pole in the press room and do other interesting things. Uh, and that, I think that had something to do with my interest in journalism. Yeah, well, that, uh, that answers the next question I was going to ask, is uh, uh, how you got interested in journalism. That's, a, well, that's an interesting story. But I think you also get interested in it from um, recognition that the things, the other things you're interested in, you can work with in journalism. You can do, um, I was interested in sports, so I, I could go to, I could get paid to cover basketball games and football games. Or later on, I became interested in um, reviewing, and I could, um, I could actually go to movies and theater and get paid to review it. So there was some kind, there was that kind of motivation mixed in with it. I was in plays in high school. Mm -hmm. I played basketball and I played tennis, and um, basketball, tennis, theater, and some debate were my main high school activities besides the student newspaper. And then from high school you came here to I came uh, here, well, Omaha University back then. I was working full time in the daytime at the World Herald as what was then called a copy boy and mm -hmm. later became called a copy messenger and other titles. And the World Herald allowed me to work Sundays as a reporter soon. And I took a night class at, at this university when it was Omaha University mm -hmm. from Lloyd Berg who was a prog uh, uh, an advertising uh, man um, came from a background in education, but the class I took in the fall of 54 was full of senior journalism types, some of whom were Korean War veterans, others who have become prominent in the community in different roles, like Betty Ellsworth Davis, once our alumni director and active in the Historical Society now and other areas. And um, they, they were sort of heroic figures to me. Mm -hmm. They went on to become things like the editor of Business Week, and uh, hold all kinds of other interesting positions. And I was in the classroom with them as a very young 17-year-old. Maybe I turned 18 sometime during that class, but that, that was my introduction to college education. That's, um, that's interesting. We were a, a university back then, and, and to some extent still are, that, uh, that emphasized uh, education for the older sure. student or the adult student. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this was part of your experience too, to be mixed yeah. in with the uh, with that group well, uh, as a youngster. Yeah, the thing that was interesting about it is, at the age I entered that class, it was a cl class in the community newspaper, mm -hmm. and Lloyd had uh, Berg ah, had done some okay. editing for like the Sun newspapers. But the people in the class, um, t to me, all already um, had the signs of yeah. professional success. They were already doing things. Uh, one of them. Uh, his father was an Associated Press man, Dave Langevin, and Langevin was already, you know, probably the editor of the Gateway or something like that. Lou Radcliffe was the president of the, the student council at, on campus and was in the sports information office. And these are people that in the next, uh, if not at that time, within the next year or so, were, were really among the leaders on campus in a variety of mm. things. And I, and I was a copy boy, so I read all the newspapers all the time and all the mail. And when Berg would conduct a news quiz in the class, uh, I was competing with those old timers, but I probably was a little more up on the news than the rest of them. So I sort of enjoyed that, uh, you know, enjoyed that challenge. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then you, uh, so so you got finally got your degree here. I, your I, I went. Degree. I finally went to school here full time, double mm -hmm. majored in journalism and English, and um, with a minor in philosophy, with professors like Wilfred Payne, mm -hmm. professors in English like Ralph Wardle, uh, terrific. Um, models of, yes. of teaching and, and scholarship. And then I went on to do a master's here in English. So wh what year did you complete your bachelor's degree? Good question. No, I, believe, I believe it was, you've got my resume. <laughs> I believe it was 1960. I took one class in 54. I started full time in 55. And I, my recollection is it took me five years because I was working full time and I usually took a little less than a um, you know, I, I took maybe 12 sure. hours instead of 15 or something. And then you went on and finished a master's degree. I did the master's here with what I consider the best teaching faculty mm -hmm. I've ever been exposed to. Uh, in the English department at that time, Ralph Wardle had been the department chairman, was a scholar from Harvard, and, and, and Bob Harper, still a friend of mine, yes. a scholar from Chicago University. And the rest of that faculty, Paul Rogers, Paul Allen, uh, later on, uh, Dick Lane and uh, Newkirk and others mm -hmm. came along. Tom Walsh was my thesis mm -hmm. advisor who's retiring this year. And uh, when I did my thesis on Jane Austen and the fact that Jane Austen was not the subtle satirist that people thought, but was an uproarious parodist who was having a hilarious time with the literature of her time, my committee included Wardle and Harper, 
a very prominent history professor named V. Stanley Trickett. <laughs> And uh, Walsh was my advisor, but it was an interesting group of people, and uh, that was a great experience for me. And the Ph.D. faculty that I studied under at the University of Minnesota um, was not as outstanding a teaching faculty, but they were a terrific research faculty at that doctoral level. So you, um, you spent some time here after your master's degree yes, uh, I did. Uh, yeah. before going on to your I, I did jump ahead a little on you there, but the... Uh, um, Yes, I was here on the faculty starting um, in the mid-60s, and then I went to work. I, I spent a summer or so working on my doctorate before I left to go at it full-time mm -hmm. in the 68-69 school year, and then I finished it up again in summers. But I came into that doctoral program with that master's in literature. Um, they allowed me to count that for one aspect of an area of specialization outside that department. And uh, I was able to teach. I was not a graduate teaching assistant, but I was given an appointment as a faculty member, as a part-time faculty member, which mm -hmm. was a little better status sure. there. And so I did some teaching, and I, um, I studied there to complete that doctoral program. That was an interesting program, because after World War II, this was the leading doctoral program in the area of mass communication. Now, this is at the University it, of Minnesota. Minnesota. How people, did you happen to go up there? Uh, well, you're telling me it's a, 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 it's a leading program. It's is that the reason? Well, no. I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it was fortunate that it was a leading program, but yeah. I got interested in it because uh, uh, the man who hired me to teach in the, uh, what was then the journalism department, Paul Peterson, had completed his doctorate at Minnesota. And Paul hired Joe McCartney, who taught here for some time and later became head of public relations at Union Pacific Railroad. He, he brought us in at the same time. Uh, Joe did his master's at Minnesota, and I did my doctorate mm -hmm. there. And um, it, was a, it was a marvelous experience because, as I started to say, Ralph Casey came out of the World War II uh, communication information and propaganda effort. And it really was, that was the impetus for doctoral study in mass communication. Came out of that, out of World War II. The Minnesota people spawned the other top programs in the country, primarily. In other words, the people who later headed Northwestern, Wisconsin, and other prominent mm -hmm. uh, doctoral programs in there tended to come out of Minnesota. Mm. Uh, some of those programs caught up with Minnesota later, but early on, Minnesota had, my main advisor was a, uh, an American history PhD from Berkeley, from California, mm -hmm. uh, Ed Emery, who then was the author of the leading text in the history of mass communication. And other people had backgrounds in American studies and so on. And it was just uh, an unusually, um, a lot of leadership in their scholarly fields in that faculty at Minnesota. Now, I understand uh, how you got into journalism because uh, yeah. we've talked about that already. Mm -hmm. But uh, how did. Uh, how did your interest in the history of journalism develop? Well, you have to keep in mind that I, before I did this, I had taken the master's in literature and yes. I had double majored in English as an undergraduate. So my interest in literature was strong. And I had to make a decision when I went to work on a doctorate. Was I going to work on a doctorate in English where I already had a master's or was I going to work on it in mass comm? Well, I decided that my professional experience in journalism and that my interest in literature could really combine in that field. And so I was interested in the literature of journalism. Uh, in other words, my, my, my dissertation study uh, looked at the development of reporting in the 19th century. So what I was really looking at was somewhat akin to what you might yeah. do in some literary analysis, looking at the way reporters um, develop their, their craft and their profession. Uh, what techniques do they use? Where did they borrow from? Mm -hmm. They borrowed, of course, from what I subject my history of uh, mass communication students to the notion of pre-existing non-journalistic forms. That's sort of an awful phrase, but they, they borrowed from the fields that um, already were communicating. Sure. They borrowed from letters. They borrowed from literature. They borrowed from a variety of areas. But um, that's where my um, interest, you know, yeah, that's how I sort of spread into history. Spend the entire hour and more, I think, just talking on that topic. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. But I think we do, that, we do need to move on a little. We ought to get to the university <laughs> <laughs> at some right. point. Huh? Well, all of this time, uh, you st were working at least off and on as a, uh, uh, as a reporter in Council Bluffs, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I went from the World Herald where I picked up some odd assignments as well as being the, the copy messenger. Mm -hmm. 
and I went over to Council Bluffs as a full-time reporter, night, nighttime reporter at the Nonpareil. Mm -hmm. That meant two things. During the school year, I was working roughly five days a week in the evenings. During the summer, I filled in for everybody's vacation. So in the summer, I was for two weeks, I was the head photographer. Mm -hmm. For two weeks, <laughs> I was the state editor. For two weeks, I was the city hall reporter. For two weeks, I was the police reporter, and so on. Um, after working there, after um, graduating, after going, um, getting my bachelor's degree, uh, spending six months in uh, the service, um, Fort Leonard Wood basic training, uh, Fort Sam Houston, and training as a medic because I was in a headquarters oh. company that needed medics. I went uh, through the medical program at Fort Sam Houston. Oh, did too. you? Brook yeah, Army Medical Brook Center. Brook Army Medical Center, <laughs> that's right. And that meant uh, spending uh, Christmas in Mexico <laughs> <laughs> and so on. Um, after doing that, I came back to Omaha, and while I was there, I received a letter from the Nonpareil asking me to become uh, what a, it's a role that Nebraskans would know best in terms of Tom Allen's mm -hmm. reporting around the state of Nebraska for the World Herald. I was on the road. Um, as a young married man, it meant getting a, a new car <laughs> to drive, which was my car to take home, which was a, a nice bonus. And uh, it meant roving around doing stories about southwest Iowa. Um, well, after doing that and then picking up, then, then I convinced them that I should also, in some other fair time, I should review movies and the like and theater. Uh, and run the entertainment page on Sundays. I did that for a couple years, and then I got a call from Paul Williams, who was the managing editor of the Sun Newspapers. And um, at that time, the Sun Newspapers were the most really innovative group of community newspapers, perhaps, in the country. Under Paul Williams' leadership, they won every major award that newspapers can win, the J.C. Penney Business Reporting Awards, and finally mm -hmm. the um, Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Reporting. I was to replace a man named Ken Woodward, who went straight from the Sun newspapers to become the religion editor of Newsweek, where he remains today. Mm -hmm. We're talking about, you yes. know, uh, more, more than 35 years mm -hmm. later. Um, so uh, that was an opportunity to do in-depth investigative journalists on a, regular, on a regular basis, not daily journalism, where you're constantly hitting deadlines, mm -hmm. but developing major stories. And the first major story that I did for them was of a controversy over the new head of the University of Omaha, Leland Trawick, when Congressman Glenn Cunningham... It certainly was controversial. Well, Congressman <laughs> Cunningham was upset about the fact that he had um, not taken um, what at that time what I guess would have been the politically correct position about um, communism in relationship to something that... Oh, should a communist be allowed to speak on mm -hmm. campus, if I remember correctly? Uh, that sort of thing. In any case, uh, I wrote that Sun Special major story and um, did a lot of that kind of reporting. I was called a health, education, and welfare reporter. I covered the Omaha School Board. I covered Doc Lyman at the Health Department. And out of that um, experience came the call uh, from Paul Peterson to um, join the faculty. I had my daily newspaper experience at the non my I was going community. to say, this must have been uh, great for your students to have someone in the classroom who uh, who had real, quotes, real yeah. world experience, and well, not just experience, but experience in a variety of different yeah. positions. Of course, that was sort of the um, essence of journalism education then, uh, and, and only a little less so now. Mm -hmm. uh, we still look for people who have both the academic and the professional credentials. Yes. and. Uh, uh, at that time, uh, as I started to teach full-time, I continued to do some of those major stories for the Sun newspaper. Mm -hmm. So I, I maintained my connection to, uh, with journalism while I was teaching. Okay, and then so uh, you eventually ended up, uh, of course, as we've said, at the University of Minnesota, finishing a doctoral yeah, degree Yeah, that there. came about three years into my um, uh, UNO. Right. Experience, as I recall, did you? Uh, I should have looked at my resume. Did you take time off uh, full time to uh, go up to Minnesota, or did you do that? I, I just did one year full. One year full time, yeah. and the rest you uh, filled yeah. in. That was, that was interesting to me because I loved that environment up there. Yes. I mean, it was a very, uh, it was a very creative academic environment. The kind of people I was working with, my fellow PhD students went on to become heads of programs like at North Carolina, mm -hmm. and among the leading authors uh, of works in the field and so on, but. Um, be honest with you, as much as I enjoyed it, after a year and a summer of it, I was really anxious to get back into the mix of teaching and community journalism. Mm -hmm. In other words, 
Uh, I missed. The I wasn't missing the teaching so much because I was teaching up there, but I missed being totally involved in in the journalism of the, of the community. I wrote a few things while I was up there for like the Minnesota Daily mm -hmm. and things like that because I I'm I'm sort of addicted to doing journalistic writing. Well, tell me about tell me some more about what the UNO campus was like back in when you first started. Well, when I first took a class, um, I, I'm I'm sure the only buildings were the. Uh, um, what we now called Arts and Sciences Hall, mm -hmm. which was the main administration building, the building with the cupola on top, and of course the um, then the hype then not hyper excuse me then the field house, field house. of course was up, and uh, that that had been there. Those two buildings had been there at that time. Um, the 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 new library, which is now the administration building, came along later. Frankly, I don't remember all the years all those things happened. What I can tell you is this: if you if you arrived at university at that time. And you didn't arrive. Uh, mm -hmm. You arrived in, in that time frame too. Um, all the growth and the additions um, always just seemed like a, you know, just a wonderful expansion of what was already there. There certainly were things about, um, you know, there were certainly limitations in teaching sure. there at first. And over the years, uh, in addition to attending classes, and then when I started teaching, I've, I've been located a variety of places on campus. I think when I started teaching, we were over in the. Um, what was then called the Applied Arts Building yeah. and is now called the Engineering Building up in the... Uh, and the journalism was part of uh, yeah. College of Applied Arts and Yes, Sciences it was, under Dean Helmstetter. Yeah. And we were, we were located in that um, northwest um, corner of that building. And the Gateway offices, the student newspaper offices, and the yearbook offices, then the Tomahawk mm. yearbook was still in existence, they were, they were right next to my office as a faculty member. And one of my assignments as a faculty member was to advise the Gateway. Which, and by the way, if you want to talk about changes, uh, for those people who now and then get perturbed with something in the gateway, uh, it was a very tame, um, what should I say, controlled um, house organ for the university administration when I arrived. The, the most remarkable thing I saw was defined as I started advising the gateway. A story about the student council appeared in the gateway. It was not a news story. At the end, it was signed, respectfully submitted, <laughs> so-and-so, secretary of the student council. Well, why do you do that? Well, Dean Flaster thinks that's the way we should cover the student council. Mm. Uh, the years when student government would be covered in a manner that caused student government leaders to try to figure out ways to cut the gateway <laughs> funds because they didn't like how the gateway reported on them were far in the future yeah. at that point. But we did stop that policy almost immediately. Interesting. Yeah. What was the um, what was the curriculum like back then? Was it much different than today? Well, keep in mind that it was then a journalism department yes. separate from the speech department. Later, we of course combined to become the communication department. Um, the main difference was that in those days, um, most of our majors were journalism majors without the public relations um, connection. In other words, while, while our people were going into public relations, they tended to be going into public relations from newspaper and sure. broadcast journalism. They would work in, they'd work on television stations, they would work in newspapers, and then Mutual of Omaha or mm -hmm. Northern Natural in those days, later, you yes. know, Internorth and Enron would hire them, or the telephone company, or wherever it might be, would tend to hire those people. There were some people in those days that went directly into public relations. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that when I joined the faculty, it's not until 1968, three years later, that, the, that what was then called Sigma Delta Chi and is now the Society of Professional Journalists admitted women. And when my late wife Sue, who was a journalism major, uh, a little couple years behind me, when women came into journalism in the late 50s, they were told to go into home ec journalism mm -hmm. and take courses from Marge Killian in the home economics department because, after all, if a woman was going to go into journalism, she ought to be the food be editor or the women's pages. The yeah. women's <laughs> writing for the women's section. And it's important to note that at the World Herald in the 50s, there were no women working in the newsroom outside of the women's department. Mm. Molly Simpson had been an editor in the main news pages during World War II, but when the men came back from war, she was put back over into that department. But there was one woman worked there, I believe, briefly in the late 50s. It was not until the 60s that the World Herald is um, hiring women like Mary McGrath, mm -hmm. who now covers their medical page. So this was the climate for our students. 
Our students, however, our, the women students weren't. They didn't buy that. I mean, they were. <laughs> no, they were. I mean, people may have been aiming them towards. Now we didn't in our department, but before that, people were aiming them towards home act journalism. But we had women who were ready to go into any field. Well, do you have uh, more uh, over the years? Has there been an increase in the number of women uh, being majors in journalism? Yeah, from. Um, it was roughly 60-40 um, men at the start of the 70s, and mm -hmm. it was about 60 percent women, 40 percent men at the end of the 70s. Oh, so I'm there is sure a big exactly. change. But the 70s would be the time of the, great, yes. the greatest change yes. that took place there. I was trying to recall, uh, when I first came to campus, some of the students who were already students here um, included Mike Moran, who went on to become the head of uh, publications and and the uh, press uh, activities for the U.S. Olympic Committee, and um, Patty Matson, who mm -hmm. was um, a campus homecoming queen and a campus leader, and she followed more the route that our students are following today, in that she, while she worked on the Gateway as an editor, she then had an internship at the U.S. National Bank, found a good position on the magazine at uh, Northwestern Bell Telephone Company, but worked as a volunteer in uh, John McAllister's congressional campaign, was hired by him to go to Washington, became a news aide in Washington, went from the McAllister office to the Nixon White House, became an aide to Mrs. Nixon and to uh, uh, Julie Nixon Eisenhower, mm -hmm. and then went from that job to corporate communications, is now the vice president of corporate communication with ABC television. But that was... Um, that's one of the earlier students I can remember following that kind of route yes. into success. But I, I don't recall much more about the curriculum other than the fact that we required that they all work on the Gateway or the Tomahawk. Um, we urged them all to do internships, and they almost all did, but I don't believe we required no, it. Mm -hmm. But we did require that, they, that everyone had to take news writing and reporting and news editing, and we still require everyone to take news writing reporting, regardless of what their major is. Mm -hmm. But certainly a lot of things have changed over the years. We've revised curriculum to have a more fully developed public relations curriculum. We used to have broadcasting in the journalism department, broadcast journalism, and we had broadcasting in the speech department, mm -hmm. with more of the emphasis on broadcast production there. And that, the presence of broadcasting uh, courses and majors in those two departments had a lot to do with the two departments merging. Well, in let's the spend 70s. a minute on that because it was back in the mid 70s mm -hmm. that uh, journalism became part of a larger department, yeah. the Department of Communication. And as you said, that broadcasting was involved mm -hmm. and uh, speech was involved sure. in journalism. Sure. Uh, what uh, did that make any, uh, any changes in the journalism curriculum at all? Or? It made some. Um, Keep in mind that when that merger took place, that the speech department had faculty to teach courses that were required of all students, such mm -hmm. as public speaking. But we had all the majors, roughly. I mean, that's an exaggeration, yeah. but most of the majors were in the journalism department. Right. Um, somewhere before that, you probably have talked to somebody about this in an interview, somewhere before that, the dramatic arts, which had been part of speech, split off and went into the fine arts program. Yes. So that also, I think, worked towards the idea. And, other, and a few other places were doing it. We weren't among the, the very first, but we were certainly in the forefront of a change that had continued to play, place in years after that to more and more schools having communications department. It just made sense to have speech and broadcasting and journalism and public relations and advertising and so on, along with organizational communication and other fields, you know, together in a department because we were all dealing with some form of human and I suppose it helped, too, to have a person like Hugh Cowden be the chair who uh, had background both in journalism yeah. and in broadcasting I and to so. some extent in, in the speech communication. Yeah. And I think the faculty, uh, my recollection of it was that there wasn't much um, well, opposition. Well, pretty smoothly, yeah. There were a few people that were a little uncomfortable with what would happen there. We had a, when I say we, I suppose my roots in journalism, you know, we had a small faculty. When I, when, when, um, I was a student. We really had two main faculty members, and then we'd have someone like Bob McGranahan, who was the head of uni what we call university relations right. now. I think then it was called printing and general printing right. and public information or some other title. But we'd have McGranahan doing that big job and also teaching some courses, and then really only two full-time faculty members. Um, 
when Joe McCartney and I joined Paul Peterson on the faculty, Ken Fielding, who's now a fairly high-ranking executive with OPPD, um, had been trying to teach and get an advanced degree at the same time and decided that was something he didn't want to continue to do. So we had, there were the three of us. And, of course, the, uh, the most significant contribution Hugh Cowden made, aside from the fact that he was a wonderful person to work with and provided uh, a very level-headed and sensible kind of leadership, was that he m hired Bob Riley, um, a man of really remarkable yes. talent and somebody we could never afford to hire yes. had he not been located here in Omaha yeah, and wanted to teach. He's been interviewed in this series, too, and he spent a good bit sure. of time uh, talking well, about that. The point I'm getting at is we, we had then... Uh, then we might have had a faculty of, you know, Cowden and uh, Riley and McCartney and Frankie mm -hmm. and Doreen Simpson, who took over from me doing the uh, gateway advising mm -hmm. and so on. And there's a little small group. And then the speech department at that time was probably, uh, I'm sure, a larger group because of the people it takes to yes. teach all those public speaking courses and other things. But uh, it made a lot of sense to join in. And I don't think, I think it was something that, um, uh, you know, was difficult for a few people, but not not for very many. The, um, uh, how about, we, we talked about differences in, in curriculum and differences in the administration of the department. How about differences in students? Have you noticed much change in that over the years? Well, the biggest, you know, one change that would be the most obvious, and it's not as reflective as the overall experience uh, as, as maybe it, it sh could be, but of course, we had a lot of bootstrappers here. Mm -hmm. We had lots of military uh, veterans who had who were trying to get their basic degree. Yeah, and I remember, so, for the benefit of the uh, yeah. people that uh, who may be listening to this and who don't know about that program, that was one that was started by uh, Dr. Bale and a number mm -hmm. of other people back in the uh, yeah. uh, back in the fi late fifties, I think. Yeah. And there were many military officers at that time who were. Uh, uh, who had uh, been there as early as the Second World War, been in their positions, and the, when the uh, military armed services yeah. uh, developed a policy that people uh, don't uh, keep their commissions unless they have sure. a, uh, a college degree, sure. uh, sort of an up or out policy, um, they did offer them the opportunity for administrative leave to, uh, right. for a year or so to complete right. a college degree, assuming they could uh, have all much of the coursework elsewhere. And what that meant was that along with the usual mix that we have of, of non-traditional yeah. students who are maybe a few years away from, more than a couple of years away from high school, uh, we had the bootstrap. We get these and they people were here, from Operation Bootstrap. They were here position. for business. That's right. And that meant that they were often um, sort of the, the plague of the of the indifferent undergraduate curve student breakers, who, the students. That's call right. Them, yes. They raised the curve. They uh, they were terrific students. Uh, they were also, um, let me say this, sort of committed to certain ideologies and views mm -hmm. that were more likely to reflect their experience in the military and some other factors, and that made it quite interesting at the time of in the 60s. I mean, when people remember the 60s on college campuses, mm -hmm. they often think of some place like Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Um, at UNO, anybody who had any of the, uh, anybody who was inclined to be a hippie mm. <laughs> or a beatnik or run off to hate ashbury in San Francisco was bound to be outnumbered by a bunch of um, military officers who would come to class and have read everything and know all they needed to know. And from my standpoint, it was interesting and challenging. I, I, I didn't always share their views, but I loved having students in class who were that stimulating. And at least some of the other students, instead of uh, begrudging their effort and abilities, competed with them. Mm -hmm. And so you had a climate of academic competition. It that made it was, a very interesting place to be. Yeah, they would, they would typically, days. for example, in my history of mass communication class, which I'm teaching right now to about 25 students, they typically, I'd have 50 students in the class, and half of them probably would be bootstrappers. Mm -hmm. And the bootstrappers didn't all fit into one mold because some of them had been uh, military information officers and had some background in journalism, and they saw things a little bit differently, did the guys who were, you know, combat platoon leaders and jobs like that. It was interesting. Well, you were here in the Bale years. Mm -hmm. Do you um, have any recollections of Milo Bale? Sure. I, um, I, can, rec I can remember Mike, Milo Bale conducting assemblies with um, more of the... Uh, 
football coach at a pep rally atmosphere. Well, he was a football rah, coach. Rah, rah. <laughs> and, uh, um, had been, I, mean. I don't know if I don't know if anybody had ever interviewed Tom Majeski and told this story, but my my favorite Milo Bale story is the one that uh, Tom Majeski was in the art department for years told, and that's when um, Milo was uh, was capable of micromanaging. He was a wonderful leader, and he accomplished tremendous things for the university. But sometimes he also worried a lot about whether pencils were being sharpened down to a nub, and uh, and he was he did not hesitate to. Uh, let anyone from a dean, you know, to a, a custodian know what he thought was right. Uh, he didn't like smoking on campus in a time when we hadn't banned it completely. Right. But uh, one time he was walking by a classroom with the door closed, but he smelled smoke coming out. And uh, he went striding into the classroom at a full clip with his finger wagging like this and beginning to say now something about smoking. And out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a nude woman posing for a life drawing class. <laughs> he didn't know that they were having live models. He, did, he didn't know that a life drawing class required that. Um, and he was going like this in full stride and noticed that woman, he turned on his heels and just as rapidly <laughs> left the room. And um, he lost interest in the smoking problem. There was another issue there that he, he I, I guess I he had to check, story, in, yeah. check into. So. Uh, yeah, no, he was he was an interesting man. I interviewed him for the Sun newspapers when we named uh, Dr. Bale and um, the name is escaping now. I think Father Labai was the head of Creighton University mm -hmm. at the time as our Men of the Year, and I did a dual story uh, working mm -hmm. on Dr. Bale for that. But I've come to know Dr. Bale better as I've worked on the history of Dundee Presbyterian mm -hmm. Church for its centennial. And we'll have to talk about that sure. in a few minutes too. Uh, were you, uh, speaking of the Bale years, were you involved at all in the Mill Levy campaign that, uh, that was um, and Not really. Uh, I, I was not uninvolved, but I mean, I, I wasn't, because my background was as a journalist. I see. And I wanted my students, when they were in my class, to think about covering stories like this. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a natural thing for me to get involved as a campaigner mm -hmm. or something like that, but to be involved in getting my students to cover it, report on it and deal with it relatively objectively, even if it was viewed as something. I remember personally supporting it, but not, you know, campaigning sure. it and uh, having the students, um, you know, in effect, respect that ideal, too. So we lost that defense. campaign. In fact, there were two campaigns I yeah. think we lost, and um, uh, so we didn't get an increase in the mill levy and uh, taxes. Yeah, I was thinking more of the campaign uh, behalf of merger, I guess. That's what that was that. going to be my next question, yeah. because since we didn't get any more tax money from the city of Omaha, we did, uh, that did lead to our becoming part of the University of Nebraska system. Keep in mind, the reason I'm a lousy source on this subject is, uh, uh, I think the merger took place in 68, right. while I'm working on while my doctorate at, uh, Minnesota. at the University of mm -hmm. Minnesota, and summers in that time I was working on my doctorate. Um, sure. It was only a few uh, years before that, that over the winter break, I'm finishing up my master's thesis, so I'm probably more absorbed in. Um, but you did see the program things. before when it was sure. Omaha University, and then after when it's University of Nebraska at Omaha. Did you notice any differences resulting from that? Well, I just think the overall growth that came over the following, you know, mm -hmm. years certainly. Um, well, the first year we had, I've forgotten, yeah. but it's something like 25 percent increase in the number of students. Yeah. So. Yeah, and and frankly, I, I'm not I'm not that perceptive about that experience. I just mm -hmm. uh, I just uh, was one who um, I've heard people who come to our campus who've maybe um, been used to a different setting, a different climate, uh, sometimes complain about some things. And I have to say that I'm someone who is who has appreciated so much of what of the way we grew mm -hmm. and improved facilities and. While I could complain that maybe there wasn't enough money for travel, there wasn't enough money for this or that, um, at times, um, to me, it's mostly been an upbeat, positive experience to watch the way this campus expanded. And um, certainly in the more recent years, with uh, under Del Weber's leadership and with things like the Bell Tower being added and so on. Uh, but I have to say, personally, the the one big improvement that to me was just like almost a paradise was the idea of getting the hyper building. Mm. I mean, c given the facilities we had, and then when that arrived, it was like, well, it can't get any better than this. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I, I spent many, uh, many a noon hour th over there playing uh, noon hour basketball with, uh, I noticed um, uh, Dean David Hinton getting an award today and his former 
um, Dean, uh, John Kerrigan, and uh, there's a lot of people that I played basketball right. with uh, now, you know, but 10 to 15 years ago, and um, uh, that, was, uh, that was just a good example of something that made life on this campus, which always was, which I always found pleasant in the setting we're in with the parks around us and the flowers blooming in mm -hmm. the spring. But that just was just a tremendous addition to, to the quality of life on campus, I guess I would call it. Now, all of this time that you were um, teaching after you finished your mm -hmm. doctoral degree and so on, you not only taught and, uh, and uh, did some research work and uh, other scholarly mm -hmm. activities that we'll, we should talk about a little too, but you also maintained your... Uh, uh, maintain uh, a high level of professional activities. In fact, uh, I remember at one time you were uh, even a, uh, a television personality doing a sure. watching, was it watching the watchdogs? Yeah. Well, that came. Steve Murphy, who was the very distinguished news director at Channel yes. 6, Steve has been on the board of the RTNDA, the Radio Television News Directors uh, Nationally. Um, sort of a respected figure. We always liked the joke that he looked like Eric Severide, mm -hmm. the great CBS. Um, newsman. But Murphy was familiar with the work I had done for the Sun newspapers and writing columns. I wrote a weekly column for the Sun newspapers. When I went to teach in Germany um, in the mid-70s, uh, Bob Riley, uh, I asked Bob to help me out with that, and Bob mm -hmm. would write some columns. When I came back from that time in Germany... That is incidentally, that uh, just for the again for the benefit of our listeners, the UNO had a program mm -hmm. in uh, for on military bases in uh, in Europe for a while. And we had the overseas program, and we originally were going to uh, we were going to go to Berlin. And you were and, uh, at, uh, fortunately we didn't because uh, it was a lot easier. To, in, in those days, in Berlin, it was hard to get in and out of because of the. Right. So um, you did spend a year teaching oh, in, on military bases. I went over to uh, Rammstein, which was mm -hmm. the uh, U.S. Air Force Command um, in Europe in southwestern Germany, right. and. Um, Nothing better than teaching for a semester, four hours from Amsterdam, four hours from right. Paris, a few hours from the Bavarian Alps, and, uh, that was a, and so on. Yeah, that was very nice for faculty to participate. Wonderful right. experience, and okay. um, I don't know how I, I got on I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Where, where were we going before <laughs> that? Um, no, I was just talking about the, I guess, about the, um, how in the mid-70s I had, yeah, about uh, your television I came back, I came back yes. from that, um, t and Bob Riley and I continued to share that column. Well, in that column, I would comment um, somewhat satirically sometimes on politics in the community mm -hmm. and other things, but I also started writing about the media, uh, including uh, inevitably the World Herald, and um, because the World Herald has been a monopoly daily newspaper since the mid-1930s, um, there's a sense that maybe someone should sort of be occasionally questioning you know, how they do things, praising them when they do things well and criticizing some other things, and so I did that in a column. And about in the early 1980s, then Channel 6 mm -hmm. came to me and said, um, how'd you like to do something like that on television? And we talked about it. Uh, I came up with the, um, the name Watching the Watchdogs, which I like except for when I'm reminded that there's a famous musical uh, called The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas in which the watchdog character is a rather unsavory type. <laughs> so I don't like it. But the idea of the media being the watchdogs of government um, has been around for a long time. And when the media is singular, just as the government often is, uh, but the media is sort of singular in terms of the dominant role of a newspaper plus the, uh, the, the important role of television stations, it makes sense to have somebody be sure. a critical observer. And that's what we started doing in 19... In the that was in a well-received program, if I recall. Uh, well, you know, um, when I was writing columns for like free distribution newspapers like the Metropolitan, for those who didn't know it, it's like the Reader now. Uh, I did that after the Sun newspapers folded in '83. Uh, younger people on campus would be much more likely to come up to me and comment on my column, hmm. but people a few years senior to that, with a little gray in their hair, almost always would come up and. And I, I just went bought some tickets for rent the other night at the Orpheum. The woman said. I thought I recognized that voice. Weren't you the watchdog? <laughs> and that's been now, it's now been almost <laughs> 10 years, years since I quit doing the watchdog Was that thing. much of a transition for you from journalism to uh, broadcasting? Or? Well, um, newspaper journalism to broadcast journalism requires um, um, certainly some adjustments. One is the time factor. Mm -hmm. They were very generous with the time, uh, but typically on television you're likely to get 90 seconds. And uh, sometimes I could get more than that. Um, I, but yeah, I, I had to learn to write. To you, uh, even in this program, I had to learn to write. You've got 30 seconds yeah. more. Or something. I'd learned to write tighter and um, learned to write and, and 
right for reading as compared to, mm -hmm. you know, well, there are some changes in that, but, and I'll be honest with you, I've, I've always, uh, I don't know if it's my heritage of uh, the ministers in my family. I've always been sort of a preacher. I <laughs> set up in the classroom and performed. And, so you uh, got a chance to preach in that and, and, But it, I, as I mentioned, I did debate in high school. I, did, uh, I was in plays. I continued to do a little bit of that um, even when I was working. One time I was in the play Mr. Roberts while I was going to school full-time and working full-time at the Council of Blessing Amparel. And for the life of me, I cannot remember how I possibly could have done that. But I think I sneaked over to rehearsals between assignments in the evening and maybe got a couple days off or something when the, we were actually performing the play. But um, it still seems to be sort of puzzling to me that I could, that I managed to squeeze, <laughs> squeeze that in. Well, you've had a very, very successful career here at in uh, at uh, UNO, uh, I know you've had all kinds of honors. Uh, Survived for 35. Yeah, years. I think the. Uh, well, I'm uh, I'm impressed with your uh, excellent in te excellence in teaching award that you uh, got about 10 years ago. Um, that, that not uh, not a whole lot of people get that. That says you're one of the one of the better teachers on the campus. My I'm teaching a, role changed. I, I you know I guess for a program like this, it's, I think it's probably worth noting. Um, when you've been here 35 years, one of the things I ask myself is, um, you know, if there's differences in my ability to reach the students now versus then, and how to, how to um, you know, to contemplate that. And I've had people say nice things about me recently, including my former colleague Bob Riley at a, at a reception we had recently. And um, the fact of the matter is, um, when he retired more than 10 years ago, uh, Bob had some kind things then to say about my value to the department, and I was inclined to agree with him that I had I was valuable to the department, uh, and and I take at least a little bit of pride in the fact that I don't feel nearly as valuable now. I feel much mm. more dispensable, um, and one of the reasons for that is I taught different courses. I played a much larger mentor role mm. in the past. I had contact with all the undergraduate students. I took them out of their first class, recognized their talents, steered them into working on the Gateway or campus television or in the um, in internships, steered them for there into their first jobs, and Bob Riley did that role perhaps better than anyone else on our faculty, but I did a lot of that, and as I switched my teaching, I didn't do as much of that. As I completed my PhD as I teaching graduate seminars, as I chaired for a while the graduate program, um, my role changed. And I found that other people came along who could do a good job, a better job with internships than I could then at that time. And so um, I felt like, yeah, there, there have been times on this campus where I felt like I was playing a pretty important role. Now I feel like I can leave without, <laughs> without, without leaving too much of a gap. So, I, I uh, guess perhaps that's one measure of success. Well, I feel, I feel like you have to, um, you know, there's no question that when you talk about t staying one year in 35 plays for 35 years, uh, you've been doing the same thing for 35 years, not even close. Yeah. I'm not even close to what I, when I started out here, uh, a lab course, which is what we called our newsroom reporting, which is a much more hardworking course than teaching a lecture course, mm -hmm. but for some reason, that got less credit. So I might teach three Newsrag reporting groups, and that would count as one course credit. <laughs> I mean, and now it would be a full load yes, with my, and yes. now it would be a full load with my research assignment. And uh, the thing I miss about, missed about that was I would see virtually all the new students in our program. And sometimes within a couple weeks of that class, the World Herald called me, and they said, we want somebody in the sports department. I could say, well, I've got this young Henry Cordes who graduated yes. from Central High. And Henry's a very good writer, and, and I'll send him down to you. And Henry's been there ever since, and that's, yeah. I don't know what, 15, 20 years, whatever. <laughs> not, maybe not that long ago. But um, that, was the, that was the satisfying part about that job. It, it, working in a graduate seminar, um, it, it, isn't, it, it has its different type of satisfaction, but it's not the same because you don't have people who are just starting out, and in effect, you're not just discovering their talent. We, um, I, I started this, I guess, by talking about your, your accomplishments, and uh, another one that we need to recognize, I think, is you, you were the recipi recipient of the Ralph Wardle professorship, and I think that, that, was, that was a very... Uh, I think when you or someone, probably you, <laughs> notified me that I'd received that honor 
I was more moved by that than anything that's happened to me on this campus. Mm -hmm. um, I took courses from Ralph Wardle. I remain a friend of, of one of his closest friends on the faculty, Bob Harper, um, today in his retirement in Estes Park. I admired Ralph Wardle. Um, never forget taking a seminar from Ralph Wardle in which there were two groups. We saw ourselves, maybe. I shouldn't say everyone did, but some of us saw ourselves in this seminar. There's half of us who are, we sort of saw ourselves as the, as the young rebels with um, innovative ideas, and then the other half we saw as the, um, that would be a kind term here. <laughs> we saw them as the, the school teachers taking a summer course who wanted to simply reflect what the standard version of this was. Well, we, well, we want to revise and overturn yeah. all the, the, the understanding. And uh, um, Ralph Wardle, who was the kindest sort of man who would have never said anything to any of the people who were doing what we called too conventional analysis mm -hmm. of this thing, wouldn't say anything to them, but after class would say, you know, would take us on. <laughs> I mean, he would, encourage, he would encourage us to keep rocking the boat in the, in the class. And uh, so I had a great, a great admiration for him and to, to get that um, honor. We should for the perhaps camp. tell our listeners what that is. Uh, well, the Ralph Wardle Professorship was part of the 75th anniversary Diamond right. Professorship, mm -hmm. one in each college. And, um, and it was named for a distinguished yeah. professor in each college. In the case of College of Arts and Sciences, it was Dr. Ralph Wardle, who was a longtime right. professor of English yes. that we've talked about, yeah. and, uh, and, a, and a really great man. Yeah. Um, and what that means is that your colleagues on the campus named, recommended that yeah. you be named to that position. I think that w because it came from that, because it came from Absolutely. recognition of your colleagues. Oh, yeah. It was a, it was and, a uh, and it's, it's really yeah. a title. Yeah. Uh, 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 well, it has a little monetary stipend yeah. to go with it. At but first, you it was very, held at first it was very years. little. <laughs> <laughs> you held it, took it for six years. years before the funds <laughs> built yeah. up to where it uh, made it to the level they have it. And at it, now. it certainly is a, yeah. a, a distinguished recognition. Well, it, yeah, and I, uh, I was well, we're talking about I was recognitions by it. Uh, and uh, sources of such things. Uh, one of them is courses for teaching, but uh, mm -hmm. other is for um, professional work, scholarship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, could we do one of those 60-second uh, sound bites or something at this point just sure. and, and talk a little bit yeah. about your scholarship? Yeah. We're, I, I've been getting a signal here that we're getting close sure. to the end of this, but uh, of I would like to do that and then have a chance to talk a little bit about what you're going to be doing. Some, of it, um, some of it derived from my doctoral dissertation that looked at how reporting evolved in the 19th mm -hmm. century. I looked back from muckraking at the early 20th century and said, how did we get to the point where reporters were able to do this earth-shaking reporting that was changing American life. It was changing the Constitution. It made huge changes. So where did that come from? And I, I followed that trail. And I wrote, I did that kind of writing. I was active in the history division of the Journalism Educators Organization. I headed that organization and did their newsletter and headed their research effort at times like that. And a lot of my writing was for publications like Journalism Quarterly and Journalism History. Um, I did some bicentennial writing about the history of reporting for a special publication. Um, I've published in some other areas as well, but I've always tried to mix the, that kind of scholarly writing with, um, with my journalism. And you've been active in professional organizations as well. Yeah, I yeah think, I, 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 like I said, I went through the offices of that history division and uh, was, um, went, to, went to the national meetings and um, some regional meetings and others for many years. I, I probably, um, I quit doing that later, and to me it's one of the, another one of those things about the way this campus works. Uh, there was a time when I got more than my share of the travel money, mm -hmm. and there was a time when I felt it was time for me to let some younger faculty who were earning tenure and pr promotions, I'm now a full professor, I'm tenured, and, and, and I tended to step aside to let more of that money go to people that um, were climbing the ladder. Let's take a quick look at what you're going to be doing okay. as, a, as a retiree. I'm halfway through the centennial history of Dundee Presbyterian Church. That church starts in 1901, 14 years. Well, there's years. a significant relationship yeah. between that 14 church years and before you. Dundee becomes incorporated in the city of Omaha, but there are two co-pastors who are both theological seminary professors. Mm -hmm. One of them's Daniel Jenkins. Seven uh, years later, okay. after preaching at that church, Daniel Jenkins founds the University of Omaha as an adjunct to the Presbyterian Theological Seminary. He remains its president for the next 15, 17 years. Well, Dundee Presbyterian Church being just across the park here from the university, 
uh, just on the other side of Memorial Park, um, has long been closely tied to the university. So I'm looking at the history of the church primarily, but it's, it has added interest for me when we look at the fact that men like Milo Bale, uh, his chief sure. financial officer, Charlie Hoff, um, Dean Lucas, the Dean of Business Administration, we're, were officers of the church, right. and Charlie Hoff's the one who got some of the organizations of the church as their fundraising effort to serve dinner. So when you were getting served a meal at UNO, and Bob Grissom, a, uh, a senior I member of the faculty it. at the medical center, is your waiter at the table, that was because of that long-standing that connection. worked out very, very well for yeah. the university. Yeah. Uh, and then in addition, if I recall when I first came here, the Minister of Music at that uh, at Dundee Presbyterian Church was always a choir director here. Dr. Bale made a point of hiring a good Presbyterian <laughs> choir director who then <laughs> would also be the vocal music uh, director uh, of the university, which probably would raise a few eyebrows right. even then. If not, <laughs> now it would raise even more. Well, that, uh, we'll look forward to seeing that history sure. sometime. should be done this finish. fall. It'll be out in the spring of 2001. Good. And it's uh, significant to the university yeah. as well as to the church. Sure. And to the Dundee neighborhood that some yeah. of us live in. Be interesting. <laughs> or have lived in. And you've run across an old mentor of mine in the process, Ernest Ligon. That's was, right. Uh, I've run across it. such people as our scoutmaster in 1928 <laughs> was a man named Henry Fonda. Uh, <laughs> an interesting family joins the church in 1939. Uh, uh, Howard Buffett and mm -hmm. his son Warren. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are all kinds of interesting sidelights to the history, but mostly it's a spiritual journey of people in a little village who were looking for a way to bring a Sunday school to their children. Interesting. Yeah. Well, um, in a, I'm just trying to think of what we might do in the very short amount of time we have left. We've talked about people. Let's talk. A, let, let, let me give you a chance to sure. mention any others that we haven't talked about already. You know, we've talked about many of your colleagues, faculty colleagues. We've talked about Dr. Bale. We've, uh, sure. Are there any? Uh, uh, Dean Harper, many others. Are there any that uh, we've missed that you can think of? Well, in? keep in mind that my connection with the English department, I've mentioned some of those people that sure. were Ralph people Warren that I admired. Bob uh, but certainly one of the nice things about teaching in this area has been uh, working with, uh, as we mentioned, some people like Hugh Cowden and Bob Riley and yes. Joe McCartney, Dorian Simpson, but primarily also people like Paul Borgie, who started oh. this series, who are just wonderful colleagues. Good. Well, it's been really nice having you with me. I've enjoyed afternoon. being here. I uh, only wish we could go on for an hour more. I <laughs> but uh, I want to thank our audience for joining us today in a visit with Dr. Warren Frankie, a professor of journalism in the UNO Communication Department. Uh, we've been taking a look at some of the history of UN Omaha as seen through the eyes of the history makers. This is Jack Newton inviting you to join us again in the series we call Reflections in Time. Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913.